will see through this very interesting analysis of Hussein through Homer in Genesis. And there's very, there are too many questions from points to be erased on the same. Thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. Uh, the last speaker of the first session is uh, Dr. Uh, Anna Tatsi. Dr. Anna Tatsi studied classics at the University of Athens and King's College London. She received her PhD in 2010 from the University of Athens for her thesis on Pindar's Nemeans, which she's preparing for publication. She specializes in archaic Greek poetry, but she has also worked extensively on a Greek tragedy, the Sophists, mostly uh, Gorgias and Plato. She's a state school teacher of Greek, but since 2009, she is an adjunct member of the Research Center for Greek Philosophy at the Academy of Athens, where she's currently engaged in a research project on the translation and commentary of the Stoic Cleanthes uh, extant fragments. She has been part of a research project on laughter, again laughter and opening the mouth, uh, in Greek literature, the fruits of which were recently published in the volume entitled Excessi Yelotes, the uses of laughter in Greek literature, Athens 2017, by the uh, edition Smiley. Her theme today is related to this last project. It is entitled Laughter with Tears, by Yelathos, Mixed Emotions in Plato's Fellow. Uh, Greek prostitute Phrymi, 
which bears some similarity to Socrates' trial, but also some affinity to the way the emotions are portrayed in Plato's Phaedo. Last but not least, I will present some beautiful pieces of art related to this topic. The Phaedo belongs to the dialogues uh, of the middle so-called period of Plato. It is one of the best known Platonic dialogues in which the great philosopher develops his theory on the immortality of the soul. The dialogue describes the final hours of Socrates in prison before he drinks the hemlock poison that puts him to death. He is surrounded by a group of pupils and friends with whom he has a long discussion about the fate of the soul after death. This discussion is narrated by Phaedo, who was present in the prison cell quite some time after the death of Socrates, when Phaedo is no longer in Athens, but in Phileus, a small town in the northeast Peloponnese. Phileus, uh, which will come up later in my uh, presentation, had become one of the two centers of the early Pythagoreans, the other one being Thebes, after the movement dispersed from southern Italy and settled in the Greek mainland. Since one of the dominant theories of Pythagoras was the reincarnation of the soul, metempsychosis, and as Plato was no stranger to the Pythagorean philosophy, uh, it is no wonder that Plato chose Phileus to set the narrative of a story that puts forward the theory for the immortality of the soul. Phaedo tells the story at the request of Hecates, who is listed by Diogenes Laertius, among other Pythagorean philosophers from Phileus, <coughs> as a disciple of the Sicilian Pythagoreans, Philolos and Eurytus. We will talk a bit more about Phileus uh, later in my presentation, as I mentioned, uh, uh, because it is related also to the second passage from uh, Xenophon's Hellenica. The fact that the main part of the discussion in the Phaedo is between Socrates and two Pythagoreans from Thebes, Simeas and Sibis are their names, also suggests that the dialogue examines the Pythagorean theories on the soul through the perspective of Plato. Phaedo, at the beginning of his narrative to Hecates, gives a detailed description about the setting and the emotional state of those present at the prison cell for the last farewell to Socrates. Um, I will present you the beginning and the final part of the text I will read. Phaedo is uh, the narrator. My own experiences when I was with him, Socrates that is, were surprising. For pity didn't enter me, as you might have expected, given that I was witnessing the death of a friend. The man seemed to me to be happy, the Hecrates, both in his behavior and in what he said. So fearlessly and nobly did he meet his end. So the thought came to me that even his going to Hades was not without divine benefaction, and also that when he arrived there, he would fare well if anyone ever did. For these reasons, hardly any feeling of pity entered me, as you would expect of someone at a scene of misfortune, nor did I feel any pleasure that we were caught up in philosophy, as our custom had been, for in fact our conversation was a philosophical one. Instead, I had a quite peculiar experience, an unusual mixture blended together from both the pleasure and the pain as I took in the fact that his life was just about to end. Everyone present was pretty much in this state, sometimes laughing, but at other times in tears, and one of us particularly so, Apollodorus. I suppose you know the man and the way he behaves. The passage describes eloquently the emotional 
emotional state Socrates' friends were in, which is in sharp contrast to the emotional state of Socrates. Phaedo calls this mixture of laughter and tears a peculiar experience out upon the pathos, a bizarre emotion that he found quite perplex perplexing. This unusual mixture of pleasure and pain betrays the perplexity of Socrates' friends towards the serenity and calmness of the philosopher in the face of death. They were sad to lose him, <laughs> hence the tears, and they were prepared to experience a somber and gloomy atmosphere in the prison cell. However, Socrates seemed to be happy. He was a demon. Both in his demeanor and his words, and this was obvious from the fact that he saw this gathering as yet another opportunity for a philosophical conversation. Fido said he could not find real pleasure in this conversation as he normally would have, because he knew that his teacher would soon die. But he could not feel any real sorrow either, because he could see him so cheerful and happy, the same old Socrates, undisturbed as if he were oblivious to the fact that his life was about to end. So Fido could not help himself from laughing at times, and this feeling was shared by everyone present. Um, now, this quotation belongs to Immanuel Kant, but it is quoted, that's where I found it at least, in Henri Bergson's uh, um, great essay on laughter, Le Rire, which was um, written in 1900s. Um, and uh, Kant, I think, describes very uh, successfully the feeling and the reaction of uh, Socrates' friends and disciples at the prison cell. Laughter is the result of an expectation which of a sudden ends in nothing. So they expected him to be solemn and sad and maybe even crying, but on the contrary, he was happy and merry. Um, now, let me move on to the parallel passage from the Philebus. Um, the Philebus is a, a dialogue which talks a lot about emotions. <coughs> In the Philebus, Plato analyzes theoretically this mixed emotion of pleasure and pain and describes it as a kind of false pleasure, psevis idone. He argues that this falsity is a common characteristic shared by the majority of pleasures, because most pleasures presuppose a deficient state of being, a lack of a certain thing, or some kind of disturbance in the soul. This means that inevitably most pleasures involve a certain kind of pain caused by this lack or disturbance. In the Phaedo, not long after the passage I quoted previously, Socrates, right after the, the prison officers unchain him, sits up on his couch to rub his leg, which had gone numb from the iron feeder, and remarks that pleasure has a surprising natural relation to pain, and that if someone catches the one, Inevitably, he will catch the other one too. This notion reflects the theory advanced by some early natural philosophers, most notably Alcmion of Croton in South Italy, and it was also shared by the Pythagoreans, according to which the human state and the cosmos is based on pairs of contrary notions and ideas. Uh, in the Philebus, Plato opposes false pleasure to true pleasure, alithis idoni, which can be described as an emotion of pure bliss, quite similar to the emotional state Socrates was in. True pleasure occurs after an unfelt lack is satisfied. Such is the pleasure we take from beautiful sounds, colors and shapes, beautiful smells, or from learning. Uh, to sum up, 
true pleasures are pure and genuine because they are enjoyed in and of themselves, not because there is a certain feeling of lack or a certain kind of incongruence within the soul. It becomes evident now that in our passage from the Phaedo, this contrast between the true pleasure of Socrates and the mixed pleasure of his friends signifies the distance between the man who has spent his life in philosophy and those who have not yet covered that distance. Especially one of them, Apollodorus, I don't know how this works. Because I want to point the people on the painting. <laughs>
part of, uh, of Laconia to, to spend his time. Uh, but after this battle that I will refer, he had to move to leave Sparta and move to Corinth before he finally reached Athens. Um, so as the, a result of uh, the Spartans' defeat at the Battle of Electra, <coughs> the Spartan allies in the Peloponnese were under much pressure by the enemies of Sparta, which were the Argives, the Arcadians, and the Thebans, who had joined forces in order to suppress Spartan rule and control over the Peloponnese. Phileus was among the allies of Sparta, and Xenophon refers to the fact that although it was only a small town located in the vicinity of three of the biggest enemies of Sparta, in fact, Phileus was, which is here, was surrounded by enemies uh, of Sparta, Sicyon, Argos, which is somewhere down here, over there, and of course Arcadia. Uh, but Phileus uh, managed to exhibit at such a difficult time, being surrounded by enemies, uh, a very brave attitude. Phileus was committed to honor the alliance and never backed away in the face of danger. So here is the passage from uh, Xenophon's uh, Hellenica. Xenophon praises the city as a model of civic conduct and administration, admires it for its oligarchic constitution and for the great ethos <coughs> of its citizens, their fearlessness, astuteness, sorry, and perseverance. In the exact passage that follows, which you can see here, Phileus is under attack by the Arcadians and the Ilians, and with them there is a group of exiles from Phileus who belong to the opposition. The citizens of Phileus manage to repay the triple attack and push away the invasion of the enemies inside the city walls and clear off their acropolis. So the, the, the narrative goes as follows, and when they had once begun to give way, speedily the whole Acropolis had become bare of the enemy, thereupon the horsemen straight away sallied forth from the city, and the enemy upon seeing them retired, leaving behind their ladders, their dead, and likewise some of the living who had been badly lamed, and the number of the enemy who were killed, both in the fighting within and by leaping down without, was not less than 80. Then one might have beheld the men congratulating one another with hand clasps on their preservation, and the women bringing them drink, and at the same time crying for joy. Indeed, laughter mingled with tears did on that occasion really possess all who were present. This laughter mingled with tears, Cleopsigelos describes the emotional reaction of the people of Phileus as a result of the severe attack they managed to repay. The strenuous effort of the citizens to keep their city intact against their enemies who outnumbered them and their final success leaves them laughing with joy but at the same time crying with tears of amazement at the feat they accomplished. This mixed emotion is here, in this case, a human and natural response to the events, a release of the continuous stress of the battle and the fear which is only realized after the threat has passed. This description is the flip side of the platonic description of the emotions in the Phaedo. Of course, the Phaeacians uh, present the same fearlessness in this case as Socrates did in, in the, the narrative from the Phaedo, but their re reaction is quite contrary to Socrates' reaction. The emotion described here is that of people who are praised for their ethos and their civic conduct. And uh, we will see later why this has 
political connotations in both texts which are finally linked to the final case I, I am about to present, which has to do with uh, the trial of Frini. Now, Frini was an etera. I think that the word prostitute probably is not very um, um, descriptive nowadays of what hetere really were in antiquity. Um, uh, Frini uh, was from the Boeotian city of Thespiae, but she lived in Athens in the 4th century BC. Now, these hetere were high class women, usually from other cities uh, in Athens, most of them from wealthy families, often well educated, and they were professional courtesans or entertainers of high class men. They were very different from most Athenian women in that they were quite independent, both financially and socially. They were paying taxes and would join in the public life of Athens almost as equal as men. Aspasia was the most notable of them, although uh, sometimes uh, 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 the scholars prefer to call her a palatis. Uh, she became the companion of Pericles, who divorced his wife to be with her. Aspasia was known for the symposia and the gatherings she organized in her house, where she invited some of the most celebrated thinkers, including Socrates, who was allegedly influenced by Aspasia's teachings and her ability in conversations. Uh, now, Hetere would often be criticized for their way of life. They would become often a target for comedians, and in some cases, even taken to court with a charge of impiety, asedia, which is the same charge that uh, Socrates also had to face. That's why he was brought to court, asedia for corrupting the youth. Aspasia was the first such woman uh, that was accused for impiety, probably sometime around uh, uh, 440 or 439, uh, at least before the Peloponnesian War, uh, in the aftermath of another war, the Samian War, for which she was uh, held responsibly, partly, partly responsible. People said that uh, she influenced uh, Pericles to, to wage this war against Samos, because Samos at that time was uh, in battle with Miletus, which was the birthplace of uh, Aspasia. Um, so we have this information from Plutarch in his uh, book on Pericles. And uh, Aspasia faced a trial, a, an accusation rather, by the comic poet Hermicus. Hermicus, sorry. We don't know where this is uh, an historical fact or maybe a fabrication, uh, but uh, her, case, her case in court became the prototype for similar cases in court of the fourth century Hetere one of which uh, was uh, Freemis' case. Uh, Freemis was uh, the most notorious of these cases. The date of the trial is unknown, but given that Freemis was probably born around <coughs> 371 BC, uh, the case couldn't have been earlier than 350. My research on the subject so far leads, leads me to the conclusion, because there is, of course, an ambiguity on, on the subject and great discussion as to when uh, uh, this trial happened, because we do know that it happened. Um, I believe that it didn't take uh, place much later than 350 either. So the years around 350 are the most uh, likely date to place this trial. Uh, so nearly um, 50, 50 years after, after Socrates' uh, trial. 
the historical accuracy of the details concerning Freemis trial, of course, uh, uh, is again disputed. We can only compare information we have from later sources. The facts which seem to be undisputed are that she was prosecuted for capital offense by her former lover, Euthias, Ephthias is his name, maybe out of spite that she had rejected him. Um, she was defended by a famous orator of the 4th century, uh, Hyperides, who was also her lover at the time. Hyperides' speech, uh, which is entitled Defense of Freemi, regrettably is lost. We do not have it. We do know that both the speech and the trial made quite a sensation at the time and that Freemi's case had become somewhat of a rhetorical topos, a commonplace for other orators who wrote speeches for or against her as a rhetorical exercise of some sort. Uh, the prosecution of uh, Freemi was on the following charges. The introduction of a new divinity and the new cult in Athens of the god Isovetis, shameless revel reveling in the Lyceum, the formation of illicit bands, theasy, of men and women. The god's name, Isovetis, means equal share. The cult of Isovetis was open to both men and women, and he was quite popular among women of ill repute, like courtesans. The meaning of the god's name, as well as the practices involved in his cult, suggest that he was linked with a desire for legislative and political innovations in the city of Athens. We do not know whether in Athens there was a law forbidding the introduction of new cults. However, the various cases of trials with the offense of impiety <coughs> and for introduction of new gods, including the case of Socrates and that of Aspasia, suggest that these accusations concealed political motivations. In the case of Freemi, these motivations might be found in the political rivalry between Euthias and Hyperides. So what we basically have here is that Hetere, because we have many various cases of trials of Hetere, especially in the fourth century, we do not have uh, direct evidence uh, uh, describing them, but we do have it from later sources. Uh, they were used somewhat like a scapegoat. Uh, they were the easy target uh, to, to focus on and to, to take to court instead of trying to, to pick on uh, the, the actual, uh, you know, rival, political rival. Uh, let me say a few things about Hyperides. He was active in Athenian politics. His political affiliations show that he visualized the revival of the city's past glory through a pro-war policy in the fourth century. He politically supported the social war Athens waged against uh, some city-states in the East Aegean Sea, which were all former Athenian allies. This war happened between 357 to 355 BC. It is very interesting to note that in that war, the Athenian general who led that expedition, his name was Harris, was the same general Athens sent to Phleus in that battle we saw in the previous text in 367 to help the city against the attack, the triple attack uh, they, they took. Hyperides also supported Demosthenes in his anti-Macedonian policy, and uh, his pro-war policy was opposed by, by many politicians at the time, including Euthias, who believed that because of the continuous wars, Athens had become too weak to achieve its former glory. 
These politicians thought it was wiser to save the state expenses for the domestic needs. In fact, right after the Social War in 354 BC, a law was passed by a man named Leptinis, according to which all Athenians, including the Metics, should participate in the public charges for the state festivals, Liturgia. The opposition to this law, which was finally condemned because it was passed uh, uh, rather up in an unorthodox way, is presented in one of the most and as well known speeches against Leptinis, and Hyperides supported him in his effort. I think that Phrynis' case happened not long after that time, possibly around 350 BC, uh, because her case links to that rivalry. I should also mention that Hyperides was a spokesperson for legislative innovations, particularly the acknowledgement of citizenship to foreigners in Athens, and the acknowledgement of civic rights to slaves. And finally, we have some uh, texts mentioning the abolition even of slavery in some cases. Um, now, the narrative concerning the details of the trial is reported to us by two authors, Athenaeus and Pseudo-Plutarch. Uh, well, Pseudo-Plutarch is uh, an inversion of the theologies, of the scholars. Uh, we attribute under this name all of the works of Plutarch that are dubious. Uh, but uh, they are much later uh, narrations, narratives that belong to the third century AD. And, but these two derive their account from previous biographers. Um, so the case is that uh, uh, both of them, both Athenaeus and Pseudo Plutarch, mention that during the trial, Hyperides, because he saw that he, he was getting nowhere with his plea, disrobed Phrynne of her clothes in the middle of the courthouse before the eyes of the judges who were so impressed by her beauty that they acquitted her of all charges. Athenaeus also mentions that Hyperides broke into tears uh, because he was making no progress in his plea and he wanted to convince uh, the, the judges. Uh, and some previous sources, the first source of this story that we have, uh, belongs to a comic poet, Posidibus, of the 4th to 3rd century BC. And one of his comedies entitled, entitled Ephesia, where he mentions that Phrynne was also crying while clasping the hands of each one of the jurors pleading for them to, to acquit her, to let her leave. Of course, Phrynne was finally acquitted. So now, uh, imagine if it was 350, that means that Plato was still alive. He died in 347 BC. Imagine Plato being um, a witness of this spectacle, because in this case we see the trial of a woman becoming a spectacle, uh, her crying in tears, being in tears, pleading the jurors, please save me, don't put me to death. And uh, imagine Plato being the witness of all this and uh, thinking back at uh, Socrates' case and how he was treated. We do know from Plato in the Apology that uh, Socrates was really indignant to, to all the threats that were put to him. We know that there was a double vote and the first vote uh, was a near success for him, but after the jurors saw him being uh, totally uh, oblivious to the fact that it didn't matter to him whether he would live or die, he preferred death actually, because living in Athens at, uh, 
at such a democracy, at, at such a, a constitution was uh, really beneath him, uh, the way things had gone. Uh, so imagine Plato thinking back at his teacher, his master, and seeing uh, the Athenian democracy and uh, the, the laws and the legislation and the constitution reaching such a level. It would have been, you know, he would have been really indignant, maybe appalled by, by this whole situation. Uh, so here, yes, we have a few facts about the chronology. Fido written around 370. Uh, I believe that uh, Plato maybe, uh, in view of uh, all these trials of, uh, of uh, 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 you know, of uh, prostitutes of Etele, and especially after freeing his trial, maybe added this reference to, to laughter and tears in the scenery we saw from the Fido in the beginning. We have Xenophon, the Battle of Phileus, around 369 or maybe 367 BC, and uh, Hipparides and Phryne, the difference of Phryne around 350 BC. I believe that these three texts uh, are, are filled with moral and political um, um, uh, insinuations, let's say. And um, the, it seems to me that the scene in the Phaedo and the stress that is put there on the emotions of Socrates and his friends, and specifically the reaction of Apollodorus, are a comment on the decline of the Athenian constitution. Uh, we have to remind ourselves that Plato, after his last visit to Sicily, which happened in 360 BC, a trip that nearly cost him his life, uh, was disgusted by politics, he spent the final years teaching at the academy, and no wonder feeling equally disillusioned as I believe with the political situation in Athens. Such a notorious case in court as that of Phryne, uh, with so many similarities to Socrates' own case in court, Phryne's final acquittal for arousing the pity of the jurors, would have reminded Plato of the injustice done to his beloved master, Phryne turned her trial into a spectacle, a sort of a drama play to win the acquittal, using lament and tears as her weapon. Socrates, on the contrary, does not even shed a tear in the face 